Broadcasting from Silicon Valley, California, this is Conversations with Jenny Lynn. You are watching Conversations with Jenny Lynn, and as always, I try to find the best people to share with you. And today, the handsome gentleman sitting across from me is Mr. George Munt. And he was the first American to race big tours in Europe as a professional. He also spent five years in Italy doing, uh, doing that. He is currently a volunteer in the Hall of Cycling Fame or the Hall of Fame. Welcome to Conversations with Jenny Lynn George. Thanks. I am so excited to share you with my viewers because I have many, many friends who are cyclists who enjoy cycling. And I thought it's nice to get away from politics and all of the intense stuff that is happening in the world at this time and just bringing a beautiful light topic like cycling. So you have gone down in history for many, many reasons, and I'd like you to share those with us. Well, um, the sport of bicycle racing over 100 years ago was literally the biggest sport in this country. It was bigger than baseball. It was bigger. It was the first sport in this country that had professional black athletes and professional female athletes. And this was all in the 1880s to around the 1920s, uh, shortly after World War I and before World War II. Uh, it was still a big sport during the Roaring Twenties. And um, as we came closer to World War II, it sort of died off in this country and is largely was largely forgotten until around the 70s when I started racing. And in, even then it was still a very obscure sport in this country. Meanwhile, it flourished in Europe and South America and a lot of other countries, uh, but it was largely forgotten in the US. And to a great extent, thanks to a lot of pioneering people in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, at about the same time that Steve Wozniak and other people were, you know, riding their bikes down the street to their to their computer club, there were a bunch of kids riding their bikes down the streets and then up into the hills and running into each other and joining bike clubs. And um, the sport started to take off again. And what I accomplished was you had a bunch of kids running around the Bay Area. I was in the East Bay. A lot of them were in the peninsula. And uh, we were all extremely enamored with the European racing scene, the Tour de France and all that. And, and no American had really competed. There were a few had competed on the track in Europe and had semi-professional careers, um, but not really professional careers. And our goal as wide-eyed, stupid kids riding our bikes around the Bay Area was, you know, oh man, if we could only, you know, go do that. It was impossible, it couldn't happen, it couldn't be done, which for somebody like me was like, okay, can't be done. So I did it. I was the first American to, uh, there were guys who turned pro, like I said, but the first one to ride a big tour and actually, you know, get paid and get paid well to ride on a professional team in Europe. And all of that came um, after, uh, in 1976, in the Montreal Olympic Games, no American in place in the top 60 or so since 1912. And I got a sixth place in Montreal. Uh, I did uh -huh. very well. Yes, and, um, and that in the cycling world in the US was considered sort of a watershed moment because it was the first time an American had gone, you know, toe to toe, fist to fist with the Europeans and, you know, placed in the top 10 and, and done well and showed that, that cycling was beginning to blossom in the US again. And a lot of that was because of the riders that came out of the Bay Area. Now there were other hotbeds of cycling around the country, a few of them on the East Coast and Detroit and the Michigan, those areas. Um, but the real blossoming started with the same people and the same kids that, that grew out of the same neighborhoods that created the high tech era. And to me, that's a fascinating story. Um, not only did it blossom incredible athletes and incredible performances of writers and, and show a talent that we had in California, but it also blossomed a bunch of technology. Interesting things came about because of these same people. Things people might not think about right now, but stuff like the mountain bike came out of that same group of people, all my peers in the Bay Area, um, most of them up in Marin, but a lot of them all around the Bay Area, Tom Ritchie from, from down in uh, the peninsula, Palo Alto area, uh, was considered one of the guys who built the first mountain bikes. 
um, a lot of other technology. The helmet that you put on your head when you ride a bike was essentially invented by a guy named Jim Jennis, who was one of my co-conspirators, co-riders. Guys like that in the Bay Area said, well, these little strap helmets that we had on that had horse hair in them or something like that were pretty much worthless. And he, he took some technology and some ideas and created a very light, very useful, very good helmet, which is when you go to Target or anywhere else and buy a bicycle helmet. It's all based on Jim's original designs. That's and there were other technologies. Yeah. And a lot of the technologies, the suspension that's in the more modern mountain bikes, those have come out of people in the Bay Area. And it's that same inventiveness and that same creativeness and that same willing to, to try something new that spawned the whole tech world, also spawned a resurgence in cycling that now you're seeing three or four American riders in the Tour de France, the Tour, Tour of Italy and other things like that. And we're, you know, we're actually seeing some, some good competitors. And of course, out of the Northern California area, the, one of the greatest American cyclists, Greg LeBond, who was part of well, Northern California and Northern Nevada were the same district one area. And we, of course, got to know Bob Lamont, his father first. And Greg was a kid, a couple of years younger than I. And, and, and everybody in the area, because it was such a, 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 a new sport, everybody was helping each other out. And of course, we, you know, we, everybody took Greg under their wing and wanted to see him do well. And, and you know, he's now the only American who's really, who has won the Tour de France a couple of times. And he came out of that same era. And so that blossoming, that period of time in Northern California that created the technology that we're using right now to talk is that same, I don't know what you call it. It's there's some sort of thing that I try to keep my hands under my arms because I lived in Italy for five years and what I really wanna do is this. Um, but that same, I can't do it without my hands. That same sensibility, craziness, uh, you know, cooperation that created this technology is the same thing that caused a resurgence in this sport in the United States, which is great because, you know, cycling is one of the oldest Olympic sports. It's a sport that has a great grand history in this country. And so for me personally, working with the U.S. Bicycling Hall of Fame, which is up in Davis, California now, um, you know, we've tried to capture that, that spirit. It was the same spirit. In fact, if you actually look back and say in 1895, what was the leading technology? Well, the leading technology was pneumatic tires, tubes, uh, tubes welded together to build light frames. That same technology spawned the Wright brothers because where did the Wright, Wright brothers come from? They had a bicycle shop. And that same technology, the chain, the pedal, the steering, all that stuff that came about. And the leading inventors in the United States and in the modern world in the 1890s were the people inventing things for bicycles, which then came to be used for motorcycles, automobiles, airplanes, and everything. So it's that same sort of inventive craziness that started the sport big in this country and in England and France and Germany and other places, you know, back 120 years ago, uh, spawned it yet again in a very similar way out of, you know, Silicon Valley and the San Francisco Bay Area. And it didn't really, in my opinion, come about anywhere else. It, it, it required that particular layering of inventiveness and craziness and freedom and, you know, willingness to, to risk things that is a hallmark of Silicon Valley and the whole tech world. So anyway, that's... So we're not only spiel. famous for tech, we're famous for so many things here in California. Because Absolutely. I, I mean, there's that... music, all kinds of things came out of Northern California, resurgences in things. Right. And it's that particular, I call it the soup, right? In Italy, the minestrone means a mix of everything. Right. And the particular minestrone in the Bay Area is different than a lot of other places. And not, I mean, I'm sure there's other places like that, but that particular soup of throwing this in and throwing that in and it comes together and it, you know, it, it, it boils up and some bad stuff, but mostly some good stuff comes out of it. And the, to me, the story of the tech world, the story of the Bay Area of Northern California is similar for, I mean, look at the, the blossoming music scene in, in rock and yeah. roll in, at that er, same era. I mean, let's face We're it. Talking, that, you know, which it, year was this? Which was the year that you started? Well, it was, it was, oh, I started racing in 1973, which is unusual because in within only a couple of years, at the age of 20, I was on the Olympic team, which is kind of unheard of. Um, but when I, once I made my mind up, I made my mind up and I did it. And I went to Italy the year after that. I had no money. I had nothing. I mean, I left home when I was 17 years old with my bicycle. 
and uh, a bag and that was it. And, you know, three years later, I'm on the Olympic team. And uh, the next year I go to Italy with a little bit of money in my pocket. And, um, you know, and the story continued up to a certain point. And then I said, okay, I've done it. That's enough. I'm done. I must interrupt you and ask you this for a young man or woman watching the show. At 17, you left home with your bike and a bag and you went and represented this country and you went to Canada later and you placed sixth in a world competition. Yes. What, dro- yeah. what, looking back, what was it in you? What drove you? Just as someone listening. I'm insane. I'm completely crazy. <laughs> No. <laughs> I no, have obviously. to laugh. You mean, I mean, it has to be something beyond craziness because I know that well, a lot of people don't do a lot of things because they're so fearful. They can't see the outcome, so they don't try. But there was something in you that even though you may have sure. had an element of fear, look what you did. What was it? It's a, it's a passion. I mean, I don't know how, but you know, you get bit by a bug and if you got a passion, you have to follow it. Obviously, you have to follow it, and you have to follow it with eye to whether you have the talent to do it or not. I mean, I would love to be a great painter or you know songwriter, but I don't have the talent for that. I never pursued it. I didn't have the passion. I might have developed the talent. Um, I also um, I'm a contrarian, and the number of people that told me I couldn't do it, no one could do it, Americans couldn't couldn't do it. Every time you told me I couldn't do it, that just just increased my resolve to to prove that it was wrong. You have have a very very similar personality to you. You tell me I can't do something, it becomes my mission to show you that it can be done. I am so happy to be able to share this with you. I don't think I actually had as much talent. Certainly I didn't have as much talent as say Greg LeMond. Uh, physically, my talent was pretty good. I mean, later, after I'd been successful, I was tested up at UC Berkeley and, you know, tested for what they do, Max VO2 and a bunch of stuff like that. Now they do even more tests. And, you know, my numbers were very, very high. And, uh, but I didn't publish them or let anybody know what they were. Um, so physically, I was okay. Um, but I, you know, there were other people with more talent, but, you know, I did, I got to what I wanted to do and what everybody said you couldn't do. I mean, there were, you know, here I was at 17 reading these magazines coming from Europe, you know, trying to puzzle out French of these great champions, Eddie Merckx, Roger de Vlemek, Felice Gibondi, and these, these guys, and, you know, we can't even pronounce their names. And five years later, six years later, I was racing with some of these guys. They always on the same teams with some of these guys, so, you know, world champion, professional you know, cyclists are just amazingly talented. Um, I also had an ethical issue with, uh, I didn't like to take any, uh, so we say performance enhancers, which have been an uh, issue in all sports, not just cycling. Um, but I, I ethically never went down that direction. I was perfectly happy That's to do awesome. as best I could with what I had. Well, you know, someday I figured I'm going to have kids and I want to be able to look them in the eye and say, I did it on my own without any of that stuff. And I've been able to do that. And, you know, that's, that's, I feel proud when I can look my kids in the eye and say, I didn't do any of that shit. Magnificent. I love stories like this. You know what I love the most about your story? And it's like Gaga, Lady Gaga, and so many like them who were told you couldn't sing or, you know, you can't do it. How, how are you going to do it? You have no money. You're only 17. All the reasons people give us why we can't do things. And as at this mature age that I have arrived at, I have learned that you don't share your dreams with people. It's not their dream and they cannot approach it with the same passion because a lot of times it's not their passion. And so what they do is they poo poo your dream. And if you're not someone like you or I, then you just toss it aside. And I've encountered so many people doing this that have told me that. My family said I couldn't do it, so I didn't try. And this is why I love to share time with people like you, because I want someone out there that has a dream that seems impossible or too enormous to make it happen. No, it can happen. So I would like to go back to the 17-year-old boy who took off from here with his bicycle in the bag. What was your most challenging encounter when you first got started and how did you overcome it? Well, uh, 
going back to what you were just talking about, the, the most challenging encounter is when you, you come across people and you share your dream and you think that they know something. They certainly, everybody knew more than I did. Um, and they poo-poo it and they, they tell you. I mean, I remember a guy telling me, oh, you don't have the bone structure for it. And another people telling me, oh, you know, you, you, you can't ride a bike well enough. You know, the Europeans ride this way and, and you know, Americans ride this way and you just won't cut it. And it, it took me a while, not very long, but to figure out that, and to question, where do, these, where do these people gain their experience, their knowledge? And what I fathomed fairly quickly is they didn't have any experience. They didn't have any knowledge. Even the people coaching us at the top levels, the amount of experience they had was trivial compared to where I wanted to go. And uh, so encountering those people, trying to, trying to drag me down, trying to make me feel bad, um, that kind of stuff, that's the toughest thing to overcome. And I, you know, unfortunately, when you're 17 years old, you share your enthusiasm with everybody, whether they want to hear it or not. And, um, you know, when people share their enthusiasms with me, I tell them to go for it. You know, I, if you're enthusiastic enough that it's completely taken over your brain and it's, it's your passion, you have to go for it. Um, I, I, in my, in my later part of life, I figured out that every human being has a superpower and you have a superpower and you have an Achilles heel. And my superpower, I believe, is the ability to see through bullshit. And I, like it. I learned very I learned very early on when people give me a bunch of lies and stuff like that, I have an innate sense for the most part to tell when they really know what they're talking about or not, or whether they're lying and that kind of thing. And um I uh I learned pretty early on that that most of the people were basically so I, so I questioned, I said, well, where did you learn this information? You know, and I, I rapidly learned most of them didn't know anything. And I was fortunate enough to get a hold of some Italian training books and things like that. And in reading those, um, realized that, you know, here's these guys that know how to do it. And everybody else is telling you they know how to do it, but they don't. And so I learned to sift through that stuff and, and um, you know, make my own decisions, that kind of stuff. But I, you know, the, the other thing that was difficult for me was you know, I had no money. I left home. Um, I had nothing, you know, I, I but got you a job had the in a support bike of your parents, right? No, oh, I had no support of my parents. My mother died when I was young and my father and I, my father essentially threw me out of the house um, when I graduated from high school at 17. And uh, it probably, probably one of the biggest motiv motiv motivators I had for originally cycling was the fact that my father, and I, by the way, I've, I've run into this with a lot of other people in sports. My father was a mean drunk. He was a nasty person. He was awful. And so it's, a, you know, in a family of five kids, no mother around to protect you, you do what you can to get the hell out of the house. And that is probably the primary motivation why I rode bicycles, you know, at the age of 12, I think when I was 14, I had my hundred dollar bike I bought with my paper out money. I did a ride up in Davis called the Davis Double Century, which is a 200 mile race. It was in August and I was 14 years old and I was in cutoffs and riding a bike that cost a hundred bucks back then, which, which if you think about it today, was impossible. And I, you know, and I did it with some friends from high school, you know, we were stupid. We didn't know any better. And, um, you know, but that getting out and getting away from it all, it was, that was my primary motivation originally, you know, to do a lot of hiking and a lot of camping and a lot of cycling. I love when someone turns adversity into a huge success, like you did. So you went to Italy. Why Italy? Well, um, there's a very famous cyclist, Eddie Merckx. He's the greatest cyclist of all times. You know, won the Tour de France, won everything more than anybody. And he made a comment once and he said, and I had an opportunity to go to France. He said, if you want to win bike races, go to France. If you want to learn how to race, bicy race bicycles, go to Italy. They'll teach you. So um, I, I got a connection through a friend to go race on a small team in Italy uh, the year after the Olympics. And so I took advantage of that rather than pursuing going to France and riding on one of these big teams. And uh, because I wanted, you know, I, I wasn't, I knew I wasn't going to make all that much money. You don't make that much money in sports unless you're extremely talented. And in a sport like cycling, you really, if you most of the guys who were the big shots had started racing at very young ages in Europe and had lots of support. And I didn't, but I wanted to experience it and where better than Italy. Plus the food's better. <laughs> Good reason. When did you, that. 
<laughs> when did you first represent the United States and and won? Well, I um, there were some large races in Mexico and Central America and stuff. And starting in 1974, no, 1975, there was a, there was a big race in uh, Baja. It was 14 days long, and it included many international racers, including the best amateurs, which were which at that time were Eastern Bloc countries, um, the Russians, the Poles, the East Germans. Um, and these guys were racing it. It was a very early season race. And uh, we put together a California team. There was a US national team, but we put together a California team and went down there to race as, as, a, as a team for 14 days. And I did really well. I won the King of the Mountains and you know, did, did very well. And, and learned that here were these guys that were the, you know, the world champions, uh, amateur champions, and they were the best in the world and no Americans could compete with these guys. And I was able to compete with them and win races. And uh, the next year in, in 1975, I represented the United States in the Pan American Games, which is essentially was the year before the Olympics. And that team is pretty much becomes the Olympic team the next year with, with a few exceptions. Um, people drop off and get put on. But uh, I had raced in Costa Rica and I'd raced in Canada and I'd raced a lot in the US and you know, Europeans had come over. And so one of the odd things about the Montreal Olympics was that I raced and competed and did well against all the European teams without ever actually having raced in Europe, which, um, which was, uh, you know, it's sort of overlooked, but it was again, unheard of Americans. A lot of Americans over the years had continually gone over to Europe they go to Belgium, they go to France, they go to these places, they race and race, and they get their asses kicked for two weeks and then they come back home. And, um, and that was real common. And, and, you know, I would run across these guys. Oh yeah. You know, 10 years ago, I went over to Belgium and Holland and I raced and, you know, I, and, um, and of course they were experts because they raced in Europe and you'd listen to them wide eyed. And, and then you realize, well, this guy never really raced the international guys. He just went over to that country and raced against those guys and got his ass kicked. So why should I listen to him? I'm not going to get my ass kicked. That's not the way I am. And um, so, you know, you had to sort of dis discount them and really not listen to them. And so going to Europe was, you know, important in order to gain the cred in Europe of, uh, um, you know, being able to win races. And in that in 1978, we actually, the U.S. national team sent a, a team to Italy for about four months. And they gave us uh, for four months, they gave us round trip airfare and a hundred dollars in expense money. And we had to make the rest of our way on our race winnings, <laughs> which paying for six team members and a mechanic. And we had a you know, coach and all these people, we had to win some races. And, uh, and, and I did that. And a couple of other guys did too, but mostly I did that. We did the same thing in France the next year. And then 1980 came along and they had the Olympic boycott. So I just, I made a phone call and turned pro because it wasn't worth dealing with all the politics and sports. What does it feel like when you are 17 years old, you don't have a mother, your father is, has alcohol challenges and you feel the need to be your own parent and your own provider at 17? and you take a bold step as you did and relocate it to a foreign country with very little, and you've made such a huge success on your own and became an Olympic winner. What, is that, what does that feel like? Do you sit back and think to yourself, you know, I don't know any other way, or I can't believe I did that. What what is your what is your conclusion upon reflection of that particular journey? From well, seven, I, I don't know about I don't know about other people, but for me, for example, at the Olympics, you know, I got sixth place in the road race. You know, finished in, in the lead group. Um, my only thought the next day, once I recovered, was I had to get out of the Olympic Village and go because I had a race to go do in Colorado. Um, at, when you're at the Olympics you're not making any money. And when you're doing other bike races, you're actually getting your winning prizes and you're able to sell those. Sometimes you get cash. Um, so I, from the very beginning, never looked back and always thought forward and, and always wanted to get to the next level. And that's all I cared about. And even to this day, I mean, people tell me about races I was in, they tell me about races I won and I, I can't remember because when the race is over, it's over and I move on to the next one. So, Are you kidding me? 
Are you kidding no, me? Not. No, I, I actually have a pretty poor recollection of most of the competition I did because, you know, there's a few moments that stand out in some races, but for the most part, um, you know, I, 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 you know, you just move on. You're just, the passion is telling you, go forward, go forward, go forward. And, uh, and when I decided to quit, it was because I decided I wasn't having any fun anymore. And I said, at the end of the season, if I still feel like this, I quit, I'm done. And I quit before I was 30. And that way I was able to come back and get a job in tech and work in tech for 30 years. Hmm. Why weren't you having fun anymore? Uh, well, when you turn professional, it's a different thing. You're, you're, you're very constrained in what you can do. You have a team leaders and team this and team that. And it is particularly constraining on an Italian team. You don't get a lot of opportunities to ride your own races. And, um, um, you know, it just wasn't that much fun anymore. I wasn't winning races because I was helping other people win races and I like to win. And that's, that's a problem for me. All right. I got a, a little mental tick in my brain that says I want to win. And if I can't, you know, what's the point? Are you a sore loser? Not really. If you like to I mean, win, it, I have to ask like to this win. question. You like to win. Are you a sore loser? I don't like cheaters, but you have to realize that even Eddie Merckx, the greatest cyclist of all time said, you know, he was winning maybe a third of his races and he was the best, right? So you're, you know, and it's like baseball and everything else, you're gonna lose. If you can, you can profit from losing by learning. And um, yeah, no, I mean, losing is a bigger part of winning than winning is. And if you don't accept that early on, um, you're gonna be, pretty sorry and, and angry all the time. I, now, I, I don't like cheaters. I don't like druggies, I, you know, I don't, which are, are cheaters. I don't like liars, uh, but I don't mind losing. I mean, heck, I, I when I, I tried to do some, you know, over 40 racing with some friends, you know, they call it master's racing and I did that. And I was perfectly happy to help some of my teammates who'd never won races. If we could help them win a race for the first time in their lives, it, for me, that, that, was, that was a lot of fun. I, you know, I, I don't care about winning anymore at that point. I mean, I sure. Yeah. You get me at the, in the race and I'm going hard and I'm going to, and I still have that, that tick. If I'm on a, a group ride of some kind, I did some of these gravel rides and I know I'm not in shape. And in the first, for the first five minutes, I go right to the front. I got to be in the front. I got to go. I got to be there. And then I, and then I catch myself and I go, stop being stupid. <laughs> you're old. <laughs> you're out of shape. You're going to kill yourself. I want to ask you this question, and I hope I don't offend anyone in asking you, but I think it's a, a necessary question, considering that in a lot of the competitive sports, people use drug performance help. <laughs> I don't want to, they take substances that help them, as you know. And because you mentioned earlier, you never took any of that. You don't believe in doing that. And I agree with you. It's not an honest, it's not an honest measure of your performance. Right. Did you ever feel like you lost a race to someone who did that? And all the time. All the time. And how, did, time. how did that make you feel? Well, it, that pisses me off, right? And there was nothing um, especially you could when do I was about facing it. These I was racing these masters races with guys that are all over 40 and, and I was riding up Mount Hamilton in this race. And I looked over and I saw these guys and you could tell, cause you can tell by the way they're sweating, the way they're riding the gear they're in. And I realized that they were doped to the gills. And I looked at them and I said, you guys, you guys are over 40, you're racing some dumbass race and you're doped to the gills. You know, you could kill yourself. You know, I said, what's the point? And I actually, at that point, I, I said, I'm out of here. I turned around, rode back down into my car, tore my license up, said, I'm not racing with these stupid old farts anymore. Because what's the point? I mean, it's just, it's no fun if, if you're cheating. So, Is it mandatory um, now to have tests to make sure that people well, are participating are not on drugs? So it's mandatory that you can be tested, but the number, the amount of testing they do, especially in, you know, master's competition and, and understand this is the same, whether it's in swimming, it's, it's just right. as bad or worse in cross country mm -hmm. skiing. It's not a cycling problem. The problem is, is that there just is not enough testing going on. It sounds familiar for some reason. Anyway, it could be solved very easily. I mean, everybody who enters a race pays 30 or 40 or $50 to enter the race. And if they simply tacked on a couple of dollars to that to fund the anti-doping people to come and test more races, they could do that. But there's no motivation 
within the sports community. The sports community, the, the people that run sports, the U.S. Olympic committees, the national governing bodies for all the different sports, you know, they, they, they see every positive as a, as a negative towards their sport. And their income is, you know, especially for some sports is, is dictated to a great extent by the, um, the revenues that they can get. And a lot of those revenues come directly from the athletes. A lot of them come from, from media and so on and so forth. So they don't want to discourage people in the sports, but I don't believe that that's the truth. I believe that if you actually tested it and made it clean, you'd attract more people to sports. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, so there, there are, there are ways, there's a couple of a, a couple things you could do, like I said, of just adding a couple dollars on to the entry fees for every event. You could easily fund the, the testing in all the different categories. And within a couple of years, it would clean things up real fast in, in any sport that adopted this. But like I said, there's no motivation to do it. The anti-doping associations um, would like to do it. They're just, they're not funded well enough to, to do the testing. I mean, I, I've, I've done races when I, you know, told, a couple of guys I knew that were doping that, oh yeah, I saw the anti-doping truck arriving, blah, blah, blah. And these guys didn't show up at the start line. So, and I was fabricating the whole thing, but uh, it was pretty interesting to see who didn't show up once the rumor spread and all these guys suddenly go in their cars and disappear. <laughs> I think that was hilarious. You need to go to every race and start doing that. Believe it or not, we've run out of time, but I don't okay. want to wrap my session up without doing what I always do, which is ask you, what haven't I asked you that you wanna leave with someone watching this show, especially a cyclist? Uh, any bike ride is a good bike ride. Just get out there and ride and enjoy. And uh, any bike is a good bike. If it works, get out and ride it. George, I am honored. I love everything that you have told me and most importantly the fact that you're clearly someone with integrity something so absent in the world now in so many places with so many people and as someone who comes from a place of authenticity it really bothers me but i can't change the world i can only change me and i know you are someone like me and hopefully the people that you associate with see that in you and it triggers that in them if it's lacking. And so I thank you so much for taking time out of your morning to share your expertise with us and your history, which I think is so fascinating. And maybe we can do another segment sometime down the road. I hope you'd be yeah, open for that. It. Yeah, if you ever wanna do anything about the history of the sport, I love to yes. talk about that and going way back. Um, you know, like I said, since being involved with the Cycling Hall of Fame, I, I've learned a tremendous amount about the sport, so uh, in the history of it. So Okay, let's yep. do that next time. We'll schedule another sure. segment to do that. And so uh, thank you again. And thank you for okay. watching Conversations with Jenny Lynn. When a conversation is all you need to be inspired, and if George has not inspired you, you are asleep. And I will see you next time. Hold on, hold on. I'm just gonna pause it. Broadcasting from Silicon Valley, California, this is Conversations with Jenny Lynn.